about these 15 minutes of lost lecture fame to give an extremely short introduction to open government and what I think your role could be in a digital democracy. But I think first you should know a little bit who is actually talking to you. On Twitter you find me under the name Anke D, like my name. I'm a member of the Pirate Party, a proud member of the Pirate Party, but I'm also a long-time transparency activist and I have some hobbies too. One hobby, hobby looks like uh, I am a militarist, that's not true. I was celebrating the end of the war last year near the concentration camp Ravensbrück. So I do a lot of guerrilla knitting and this guerrilla knitting I did is actually in the peace colors. So this is who I am, some shades of me. But now let's deep dive into open government. A bit of theory is probably necessary. Um, open government is based on three pillars. One of them is transparency, another one collaboration, and the third one is participation. With transparency, for example, we mean open data. You may have heard about that. It means that all data which is in the hands of our government are being uh, published so that everybody can use it for whatever purpose they want to use it and they don't have to pay for it. This would be actually ridiculous because it has been collected with taxpayers' money anyway. But transparency also refers to transparency on processes and on the outcome of those processes. A process can be lawmaking. Who actually does make the law? Is it the members of parliament, what we always used to think? Or is it the ministerial bureaucracy somewhere in the back offices? Or is it a lobbyist organization writing those laws? We don't know. With transparency in the process, we could know and we could have our judgment changed upon that knowledge. And then we like to know the outcome of a process. So that can be a contract, a public contract, where again, taxpayers' money is used to buy something. We'd like to know what is bought and on what conditions. When we talk about collaboration and open government, we mean new forms of people working together with the government and not the government people looking down on the citizens, but at the same level, which is usually not so often taking place today. Participation means deciding things by the people, but in many more occasions, it means Having people participate in decision-making processes, provide input, it means listening to the people. And then the final decision is still in the hands of those who are elected as members of a parliament. I'd now like to present just uh, some examples. This is one for collaboration from the NASA, the space agency, which had a lot of data on the surface of the Mars. The Planet, you remember school time. Um, on that map, they found lots of round shapes, dark shapes. Some of them were craters, and they wanted to know which ones were craters, and they tried to program software to find out what is just a dark spot and what is a crater. No software could do that, no machine could do that, and they didn't have enough people and not enough resources to buy people power to do this. So what they did, very clever, I think, is create um, a little online game. You can play it on the internet. I think it's, it's called something like Map Mars or so. Um, and then you can play in the game, and one part of the game, you map yourself the craters, and you circle them with a cursor, and you name a crater a crater. When some people have done that with the same shape, it goes into the official NASA map of Mars. It's a really cool game, I think. But there are other things you can do with data. These are real subway trains from the London subway, and because there, the real-time data of the public transport is actually open data, somebody could build an app where you can judge yourself how far your subway is from you and decide whether it's still time to buy a ticket or Maybe not. Open data in most cases, as raw data, looks like that. And if you are a rather normal person, some geniuses 
function different, but if you are a normal person, for you this looks pretty boring. And numbers don't talk to you. As I said, for some geniuses, this is different. But there are people with talents who are able to visualize data in a way that we all can make sense out of it. This is the same data like the one I showed a slide before. It's the public budget of the UK government, the federal government. I know that you will not be able to read what's on all those bubbles, but every big bubble is the budget of um, one ministry. And you can see yourself and judge yourself whether you like the defense budget or the interest paid on public debt to be so high in comparison to education, to environment and culture. It's much easier to have an informed opinion on something if you can see it just like that. Those colored boxes are another way of visualizing financial budget data. And I highlighted two boxes. There's a very small box in the lower left corner and a very big box in the right upper corner. And the lower one is $54 billion. And that's what it would cost to feed every single child in the entire world for one full year. The small box. The very big box. It's many times bigger. That's not 50 billion, it's 3,000 billion. It's the total cost of the Iraq war. So colored boxes. And what you see is a very big purple box in the right upper corner. That's the cost of the Iraq war. Now you see an additional box. The yellow one below, which is as big as all the other boxes together. And now guess what that is? It's the worldwide cost of the financial crisis. It's depressing. The black box on top, by the way, it's the total of all Africa's debt. So how many times could we pay off or had been paying off Africa's debt with this money wasted? With data, we can also see how money impacts decision-making and lawmaking. These lines is the flow of money paid by companies to parliamentarians. These are parliamentarians in the state of California. And those who paid $10 million to influence lawmaking are oil and gas companies. Every line is one company and the thickness is the amount of money flown. And they wanted to get rid of a law which aimed at reducing CO2. You understand the reason behind oil and gas companies. When we know this, we can influence our members of parliament that they are not acting upon the money, but acting on responsibility, because they are our representatives and not the representatives of money. In Germany, by the way, we can't have such a picture because we don't get the numbers. We have corruption problems in all countries of the world, but in some countries, these problems are even bigger. And one of the biggest problems for corruption we see in India. The Indian citizens have lobbied a lot and fought intensively for decades that the government does eventually take effective measure against corruption. But since it is such a widespread problem, that of course didn't take place. That's like asking fish and you know. That's why somebody put up a website, it's called ipaidabribe.com, where people can anonymously share their stories where they personally have paid a bribe, had to pay a bribe to get a certain outcome from the civil servants. So people enter the story, but they also enter the money they had to pay. So you can, because it's accumulated in this website, you can see which authorities are the most corrupt and which region the problem is biggest. And the government can no longer have their eyes shut and ignore the problem. I have one more depressing slide for you. I know I should entertain you, but well, that's life. 
You have to see this as a video. We don't have time to see this as a video, but the link is on the page and the page will somewhere be on the internet at Lost Lectures. Um, you have to see it and then you will see in the video how little dots are falling down and exploding. And every one of those little dots exploding is one drone strike in Pakistan. And every little explosion is people hit and died by those drones. And when you read in newspapers, three people died, died by a drone strike, you can see here, for just one country, Pakistan, how many these are. Well, you can't see the colors so well, but there are many little red and orange dots. And these are children and civilians. More than 3,100 people have been killed in this time, most of them after Obama took office. Not even 50 of them were so-called high-profile targets. All the rest was just collateral damage. We can defend our interests. Sometimes we have to create transparency bottom-up. And one way of doing it is leaking. Who had some ears on the internet today has probably noticed that the biggest leak in history um, was just now with the offshore leaks. That was another one. In 2008, the draft for the ACTA legislation was leaked to WikiLeaks. And it helped us to mobilize globally and eventually successfully prevent a really stupid law which would have censored our internet. The Avas platform collected more than two million signatures, and those signatures were given to the European Parliament, and only then the European Parliament started to think twice and to change their decision. So the EU Parliament listened to us. But bad legislation happens all the time, and we can't be alert enough for example, right now, in these weeks, still in April, the German government is planning to pass a law, it's called Bestandsdatenauskunft Germany, which would give police and the Secret Service an unprecedented, super easy access to your individual, personal, private data on the internet and communications. They can get your name, your, your address, your bank details, they can even get your password for your email, your PIN for your mobile phone. So that's basically everything, isn't it? Some of those data they can even get without a judge's warrant. And they can get it with a push of a button because there will be an electronic interface. So if you don't like that to happen, and I hope you just despise that, then help preventing it. You can do it. The 14th of April is an action day all over Germany to do this. Sometimes we have to create laws which change the democracy in a way like we want it. And that also happened. So it's not everything depressing in my presentation. One thing I found really optimistic is how in the state of Hamburg, citizens created a transparency law and they forced the Hamburg government to adopt this law. They developed and wrote this law on a public wiki, just like Wikipedia. It's totally crazy, I know, but they did it successfully. And they worked together with various NGOs, with the Chaos Computer Club, with the Pirate Party, with the Greens, and many more, and they all joined forces to get this law done. They had already the referendum scheduled, they were collecting signatures, and it was becoming clear in the state of Hamburg that the expectations of citizens were to adopt this law. And the government didn't want to lose in a referendum. And that is why they decided to adopt it. And then the mayor of the city of Hamburg was really proud, announcing Hamburg to be the most transparent state in Germany. Well, we can do that as long as we have the law we want. So what I want you to remember, if you don't drink too much tonight from this little presentation, is that in our digital society, 
we have more power than ever before. It is so much harder for secrecy and corruption to sustain in a digital society. Governments don't always open as much as we want. We see that in Germany as well. But we can open them bottom up if we join forces, if we work together. Ordinary people can do that. We can become really powerful as counterparts in policy making. So everybody of you has much more power than you probably think. But as you may have heard before, with great powers comes great responsibility. So don't forget that. Remember your power and use it wisely. Thanks.